gathered friends, listen again to our legend of the Bionicle. In a time before time, in the year 2001, a franchise would rise to save the LEGO Corporation from disaster. A line of action figures with a detailed storyline would work its way into toy stores everywhere. This franchise would expand for a decade until its untimely demise, but in the meantime, it would leave its mark on anyone who had the chance to experience it. Okay, silly intro aside, who remembers Bionicle? These toys were released as part of LEGO's Technic line, which included special pieces for building more complicated models than you could with usual LEGO pieces. Bionicle, aka Biological Chronicle, allowed you to build your own humanoid figures that had their own little world. It was so successful that it actually helped LEGO out of a financial crisis. You could always catch their commercials or movies on children's TV channels, their books were almost always available at Scholastic Book Fairs, and their toys would often take up whole displays in whatever store they were being sold in. When I was in school, you could ask any random student about Bionicle and they'd have some opinion on it. This wasn't just some obscure franchise that only a few people knew about. This series had movies, comics, books, games, canon flash animations, everything but a TV show. This series made a permanent mark on the childhoods of many, then everyone forgot about it. With a series as big and expansive as Bionicle, it's hard to believe it fell as hard as it did. The lore is so expansive, people are often shocked when you explain just a fraction of it. So how do you even begin to cover a franchise of this magnitude? Of course, we should start from the beginning, but with all the characters and all the backstories, it'd be impossible to explain it all in a cohesive manner. Luckily for us, the LEGO and Bionicle teams thought ahead. There is a Flash game that kicked off the lore of the franchise and introduced every aspect of the original series to newcomers. It's called Mata Nui Online. If you want a quick and easy way to understand the universe and the characters in it, playing this game is one of your best options. Let's go through it and talk about all there is to see. It's time to take a dive into the world of Bionicle. At the start, we see that we're on a beach and a large canister has washed ashore. This is meant to represent the canister a Toa figure would come in. If you're wondering what a Toa is, there's one to the right of us. This first cutscene of Toa Tahu, aka the Red One, is honestly awesome and an intense way to start the game. So let's not follow him and go see this little blue Bionicle instead. When you speak to someone, you get up to four dialogue options to move the story forward. This is Maku, and she's a Matoran, a Ga Matoran to be specific, aka a Matoran of water. You may be surprised to hear that these little guys are actually the common human equivalent Bionicles rather than the Toa. Their figures were popularly released as toys that came with McDonald's Happy Meals. These figures are often referred to as the Mictoran. In the original version of this game, they were referred to as Tohunga. This was changed because of a lawsuit regarding several names derived from the Maori language being used inappropriately. LEGO agreed to change a few names, but they were allowed to use many others. Tohunga, being a very honorable term in the Maori language, wasn't a good fit for common villagers. Honestly, I feel like Matoran works better for them anyway, they already have too many T-words in this series. The village of Gakoro was attacked by a Rahi. The Rahi are sort of like animals in the Bionicle continuity, but they've been acting out of control as of late. You need to go to the village to find its elder, Nokama, while Maku goes to find Gali, the Toa of Water. To get in, you have to balance a scale with rocks. If you lift the rocks in the air and drop them, they fall really slowly. It's so satisfying, I just want to do this for the rest of the game. The Gamatoran are trapped under water, so you use a light stone to search through the ocean's darkness so you can find a missing gear and fix a contraption to raise the hut they're trapped in to the surface. So glad they thought of that intricate system in the case of this specific situation ever happening. It's relatively straightforward, but it can take a while to explore the whole ocean. Whoa. The Tarakava Rahi returns, but Gali shows up and defeats it by removing a mask that was controlling it. You are then able to freely explore the village and talk to its inhabitants. While we're here, these little blue guys are worth noting because they're the only female species of Matoran. At the same time, the sexes aren't designed or portrayed any differently, which is pretty remarkable. Of course, Rudaka may be an exception, but we'll get to her at a later time. 
When you talk to Nokama, the village elder, aka the Turaga, she elaborates on some lore. You're on the island of Mata Nui, named after the Great Spirit, aka the god that created it. And the Toa are the defenders of the Matoran sent by Mata Nui. You're an adventurer, but your identity in this universe remains a mystery for now. The Matoran need to be defended because an entity known as the Makuta is threatening them. Our current knowledge suggests that he's like Mata Nui, except evil. You also find out that the Toa have special masks of power that give them abilities. Gali can breathe underwater with hers, for example. There's one other thing I'd like to mention here. Nokama explains that Maku often sneaks out of the village to spend time with Hyuki, the champion of the in-universe sport, Koli. This is obviously hinting at a romance between the two, but the topic of love has become a heavy point of discussion in the community. According to Greg Farshti, the writer of the book series, love isn't canon. This actually contradicts quite a few scenes throughout the franchise, mostly in the movies. However, there's somewhat of an explanation for this. The books are what most people use to follow the story. Reading them is arguably the best way to fully indulge in the universe. At the same time, Greg's word is not final on everything Bionicle-related. He wrote the books based around plot points the writers on the team gave him. Yes, the books are a great way to follow the story, but they're just one piece of a massive collaboration between many different creators. Besides, the shippers would heavily disagree with him. Your next destination is Po Koro, where Hyuki lives. As the name suggests, this is home to the Po Matoran. But first, you have to visit the tribe's astrologer to learn about the telescope that lets you see the stars. In the words of this Matoran, when the red star reaches a certain place in the heavens, it means something important will happen. I'm sure this red star won't have universe-changing significance much later in the series. You can head to the telescope to see where the red star is, then use this wall to see which prophecy will come true based on where it is in the sky. It even foreshadows the Borok invasion, which isn't fully covered in this game. There's also text written in the Matoran language. If you're wondering how to read it, here you go! This game actually encourages you to learn it because signs and other details are written in it. It can be very handy when you're at a crossroads and need to know which way to go. We can also watch the origin story of the universe play out. Mata Nui created the world we're in before the evil Makuta, often referred to as his brother, attacked, forcing Mata Nui into a deep sleep while he ravaged the world. The six Toa then arrived to fight back and to hopefully awaken the Great Spirit. You're probably wondering how I could make all that out from just an animation of rocks. The truth is, I'm actually magical. You can use a boat to sail to Powahi, the desert that contains the village of Pokoro. Because the Pomatorans are master carvers, there are many structures in the desert, a lot of which were made by a guy named Hafu. It's also the biggest place for Koli matches. However, you quickly find out that everyone's gotten sick and can't play it anymore, including Hyuki. You also meet a suspicious salesman who's selling special Koli balls. I see no way he can possibly be involved here. You can tell Turaga Onua about the diseased balls, so he sends you to find out where they came from. You explore the desert until you reach these Toa statues, then you try to open each of them until you find the cave that contains the deadly balls. Then Arahi attacks, but Stone Toa Pohatu shows up to save the day. Or not. With Pohatu blind, you have to guide him on where to kick the infected balls so you can destroy the Rahi's nest. I found this game really hard at first, but then I realized you could do a faster kick by holding down the mouse button. Made it so much easier. After you flee, Pohatu takes the balls away to pollute the ocean with them and everyone is healed instantaneously. Onua gives you a carving tool and tells you to show it to Nokama. It's probably his way of saying, Sorry we brought balls of death into your home. Nokama gives you a book and tells you to write down everything you encounter for future generations. She refers to you as Chronicler. So if you were like most people nowadays and you watched the first movie before playing this, you already know who you're playing as. Let's just pretend we don't. If you follow the footprints left by Tahu, you can head to the volcanic village of Takoro. Here, you meet a very popular character, Jala. Before the first movie changed his personality to be more relatable for children, he was a fearsome warlord who frequently led soldiers into combat. Even the way he talks is far more sophisticated than the movie would suggest. Further in the village, you see lava surfers and lava farmers, because that's a thing people do here. I also can't get over these guys dancing in the background. I don't know what their deal is. 
This one Matoran hands you a surfboard, talking as if he knows you. I wonder if you might possibly be a Ta Matoran. When you talk to Turaga Vakama, he tells you the tale of how Jala encountered Tahu after his arrival. This arrival of the Toa spells good news for the future of Matanui. Vakama also knows you and acknowledges you have done many great deeds in the past. Yep, totally a Ta something. In the burned up forest behind Takoro, you meet Kapura, who mystically warns you about Makuta and how he's the bringer of destruction. You also wander the forest forever unless you follow the X's marked on the trees. For now, let's head back to Powahi. In front of a big cave, some guy offers to give you a crab before you go to the village of Onukoro. If you are expecting something edible, you'd be mistaken, because usso crabs are giant crabs that you can ride on the backs of. The one he gives you, Puku, takes you to the cavernous village of Onukoro. The villagers are miners, and the village serves as a marketplace for others around the island. You see a few Matoran pestering Turaga Wenua about their various problems. Guess who has to help out with all three of them? You have to help a miner named Taipu dig a highway to the village of Lake Koro. The Onu Matoran need more light stones, and mining guilds have hit a wall of protodermis they can't break through. Protodermis is actually a component that's essential to the Bionicle universe. The best way to describe it to someone is... It's kind of like water, but it's more of a chemical, and it's used to build everything, both living and inanimate. Bionicle lore is weird. You then explore this dark cave until you reach a lava flow that's leaked in from Takoro. You know what that means. You mess with the machine until you can light up all the buttons, then it drains the lava. Again, these Matorans seriously think of everything for every potential catastrophe. It's astounding anything even goes wrong in this universe to begin with. You then find mines filled with lightstone, and it's places like this that really make me appreciate the Onukoro location. I love the concept of an underground mining-centered civilization, and they're amazingly creative with it. I also like these elevators you can take to different levels underground. At the lowest level, you see this large sundial, which is reminiscent of... Wait, that's a spoiler. According to this Matoran, it's the layer of protodermis they can't mine through. After solving its puzzle, you head inside and find a golden mask, or a kanohi. It's a how mask, to be specific. With the light stones, Taipu completes his dig to Lake Koro, then he accompanies you on the journey over there. Bye. You then reach an elevator that takes you into the trees. Again, I have to commend the creative world building. This is Lei Koro, but it's shockingly empty. If you find this flute around, you can actually play it. I guess germs aren't a big concern around here. It has a pattern pre-installed, so you replicate it and the music brings everyone out of hiding. A Matoran named Tamaru explains that they were hiding from Rahi that attacked their village. Since we're here, we have to mention the speech mannerisms of the Le Matoran and their Toa. It's called tree speak, or shoot speak in a later iteration. They speak like in a way that word combines, if you know what I mean. It's a strange dialect, but it adds a certain charisma to the Le characters throughout the series. Kangu explains that Turaga Matau has been uptaken by the Rahi and Toa Lua is nowhere to be seen found. Kangu is a skilled pilot and a fierce warrior soldier. After you talk chat with him, the Rahi known as Nui Rama quick fly in from their distant tower to battle fight. You fly ride on a Kahu bird with Kangu to be his disc thrower, which is a reference to how the Mictoran sets came with disc launchers as part of their toy design. This minigame is my yet favorite, ever quick as it may be. It's hard to keep up with the Nui Rama as they in-fly at light speed. The game itself is easy, but the fast flight makes it hard to tell what's going on sometimes. Also, the music is strange odd. <laughs> In the Nui Rama nest, you search find Matau among a bunch of Matoran. However, you did not think plan a method to get outways. It's noteworthy that Matau is nothing like the comic relief character he is in the movie films, but he explained tells how Lua, Toa Hero of Air, has been infected by an evil mask that allows Makuta to control him. 
Oh look, it's Toa Onua. That'll quick solve the issue. The Toa battle fight until Lua changes his mind about this whole evil thing. We see that Toa can switch change their masks to have different powers at will. Again, with powers like these, it's a wonder anything ever wrong goes in Mata Nui to begin with. When Lua reclaims his mask, he uses a power to make a Nui Rama help him and everyone else fear flee. Then they all music make. Okay, that's over, back to English. Though I should mention that Lua obtained a golden kanohi, which signifies something called a Toa Kaita will appear later on. You can now use the flute to summon a bird to come and give you a lift everywhere. It's a nice feature, but it doesn't always work for me and I can't figure out why. Maybe the bird heard my horrible attempt at tree speak. Now we head back to Taokoro, where Jala tells us some dire news. The Rahi are advancing and the Toa are gathering at a meeting point in Kini Nui and they need to be protected. Because of this, you're forced to enlist in the army. Hate when that happens. Jala tells you to go through an icy pass to the secretive village of Kokoro, not to be confused with the Japanese word for heart. There, you find a frozen Matoran, but by using a heat stone, you can unfreeze him. He says nothing and runs away. Talk about ungrateful. You follow him to a secret passageway, and though he says very little, his name is Kopeke, and he tells you about Taraga Nuju. Kokoro is a place of high knowledge and little speech, so the Komatorans are kind of like the in-universe equivalent of Buddhist monks. You then have this puzzle that tests your memory on recognizing the characters you've met. I really like this because it's a good way to make sure the player is following along. Kokoro looks pretty vacant, but there's this cool sanctum with walls of wisdom everywhere. It's here that you learn yet another strange speech mannerism. Taraga Nuju only communicates through a series of clicks and whistles reminiscent of the birds in the universe. His wisdom has stretched beyond the need for speech. The only person who can translate his way of speaking is a Matoran named Matoro. He seems like the kind of person who feels no fear, if you catch my drift. You head into the snowy landscape to find him, but the weather takes its toll on you when you pass out. However, you're awakened by Matoro, but he dies later. <coughs> Just kidding, he survives the attack and Toa Kopaka shows up. Kopaka kills the Rahi, then you and Matoro head back to Nuju. Matoro then translates his answers to any questions relating to the lore that you may have. It's prophesied that the Toa will merge together into two Toa Kaita, Wairuha and Akamai. He also says that we need an alliance to aid the Toa with. Guess who's in charge of forming that alliance? Yeah, it's you. Overall, Matoro is a really cool character. I hope he gets a special mask of his own later. With a message for the Turaga, you head back to every village and gather your army of Matoran. Vakama explains that the Toa are en route to Kini Nui, the center of the island. They are set to enter a passage into Makuta's realm where they will battle creatures known as Manas. You and your alliance must back them up so they aren't flanked when they go underground. You go around the island once more to build said alliance, gathering one Matoran from each village. Kapura from Takoro, Maku from Gakoro, Kopeke from Kokoro, Taipu from Onukoro, Tamaru from Leikoro, and Hafu from Pokoro. You can also talk to them at any time. As you maneuver through the island, they'll give you hints as to which one you should use to surpass every obstacle that comes your way. You get a cute little cutscene for each of them. Eventually, you reach this portal to Kini Nui, then you find all the Toa gathered in one place for the very first time. They're getting ready to challenge the Makuta, and they get along a lot more nicely than they do in the books. Tahu is the leader, which is understandable because all the advertising centered around him, and even though he and Kopaka are always fighting, they're at least united in this circumstance. When the Toa see you and your crew, something very interesting happens. Gali states that she and the Chronicler have a bond between them. This allows you to see Gali in your dreams while you're in separate places. This only exists so you have a reason to see the Toa underground while you're fending off the Rahi, but it becomes relevant again much later in the series. Using their golden Kanohi, the Toa unflatteringly fall into the abyss. While they're underground, the Rahi attack you RPG style, so you and your team must take turns attacking them. Between fights, you can ask your teammates which monsters they're strongest and weakest against. Like they do in their figures, the Matoran battle by throwing discs. You also see that the Toa merge together to form the Kaita, aka really big toys you can build by buying all the Toa figures. Now it's time to get a little critical. 
The Rahi you fight are randomly generated, and your health does not regenerate after every round, so it's easy to get pummeled if the game just doesn't like you. There really isn't much strategy involved as long as you keep using Kapura and Taipu. I found that if you lose enough times, the game gives you a break and lets you move forward anyway. I like the thought here, but this section could have used a little more tinkering, just to make it less dependent on chance. Down below, Wairuha and Akamai battle through an army of manas, aka Makuta's most popular minions. They're like crabs, but they're also tanks. Could there be anything scarier? Up above, just as the Rahi start getting out of hand, Kangu fast flies in to save the day, followed by all the Matoran from around the island. I guess all of them could have just come together from the very beginning, but it's best not to question it. Down below, the Kaita destroy towers that seem to be controlling the Manas, shutting them down. They then go to confront the Makuta himself, but after they enter his lair, his powers of destruction split them back into regular Toa. This also severs the bond between Gali and the Chronicler. With her last message, Gali tells the Chronicler to find them. Then we head back above ground. You hear that something happened in Onu Koro, so you ride on Puku to see what it is. There, Onua explains that the mask you found earlier has disappeared and a passage is opened. This serves as your entrance into Makuda's lair. Here, you finally discover your own identity. You're a colorful Tamatoran named Takua. He was often portrayed as the protagonist of the Matanui storyline, sometimes more so than the Toa themselves. Now that you've found yourself in Makuta's lair, you travel through the Mana's battlefield and find the Toa past the Gates of Doom. This is where we see Makuta reveal himself for the very first time. That's right, in his first incarnation, the Makuta comes in the form of the very Matoran the Toa seek to protect. However, he quickly transforms into an amalgamation of tendrils for the Toa to battle. I gotta say, this is one of the Makuta's most frightening appearances in any form of Bionicle media. The mysterious air that leaves you wondering just who he is and what he's capable of makes for the perfect setup for the series' antagonist. Many refer to him as the devil if we're to view Matanui as god, and that's a very accurate way of describing him. He's a representation of all that is evil, cunning and manipulative, bringing destruction wherever he goes. Yeah, Makuta was an awesome villain. The Toa are only able to defeat him by combining their elemental powers with the spirit of teamwork. That always works to defeat gods of destruction. He's neutralized for the time being, and the Toa are teleported away, but wait, Takua got left behind! He finds a wall where these creatures known as Borok are laying in rest. They start to wake up and he runs away. They would go on to be the villains in an upcoming story arc. For now, Takua gets away in a convenient means of transportation. <laughs> He then meets Vakama on the beach where he started the adventure. They converse by the ocean side, and it turns out that Takua is a well-known adventurer who has done a lot of stuff for the Turaga in the past. His adventurous nature made him an outcast because God forbid anyone go on adventures, but everyone loves him now so it's okay. They walk off and the game concludes with space fireworks. Hooray! So, that was the Matanui online game. Can I just say, that was spectacular. As a means of explaining the basic lore and how the universe functions, this game did an amazing job of introducing the player to the Bionicle world. As you move through it, you meet characters and learn what they can do. The game ensures that you're following the story at every opportunity it gets, so you'll know a thing or two about the world by the time you finish it. This actually feels like a legitimate adventure through the island of Matanui. Also, the world itself is incredibly creative. It's so much fun to visit places like the High Telescope or the Deep Caves of Onukoro. And you gotta love all the unique ways you can travel from village to village. You can tell a lot of thought went into the design of the continent and how every village is themed. When I decided to get back into Bionicle after forgetting about it for many years, this game sold me when I used it as my starting point. It's wonderfully made and extremely expansive. 
It gives you far more than you would ever expect from a Flash game that you could play for free. The creators had a vision and a genuine care to give it life. You can tell they loved this series and wanted to give it their all. You can see it through many different kinds of Bionicle media. Overall, the developers did a phenomenal job on this, but it was only a small preview of the massive series to come. The rest of it is still out there for us to explore. Thank you all so much for watching. I will see you in the next memory.